uh, those that have t signed up to testify. Okay, I'd like to first start, and I'll start to the right, if we can have an introduction of, of those folks that have been wishing to speak to the body in the matter of Bill 74 and in the proposed fees. I, I want to start to the right. If you can introduce yourself. Um, you can get the, you can move that microphone down, please. My name is uh, Bill Gibson. I'm executive director of the Employers Council, and I'm speaking today on behalf of that organization. Okay, good morning. Good morning. My name is Mima Iwana. I am president of Ocean Jet Club and also member of GHRA. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Buenas. I am Trini Torres, a Chamorro woman from the village of Totu, Totugo, Mung Mung Mighty. I am a member of the Colonized Chamorro Coalition and chairman of the Decolonization Commission Task Force for Independence. Good, good morning. Non Husi Peter Mayor. Uh, non okay. Husi Peter Mayor. Uh, I'm talking for myself. I'm an economist, a doctor in economics from Berkeley, a bachelor's from Caltech. And I'm talking for myself, but I have studied Guam taxes more than anyone else. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Good morning in Hafidi. Uh, my name is Paul Blas. And I'm here representing the committee to keep Guam working. Okay, thank you very much and good morning. And again, I'm going to first introduce and have allow an opportunity for, for those individuals to speak on this matter to the body. And I'll do it in the order in which you signed in again. So uh, I'd like to introduce and welcome um, Ms. Trini Torres. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Vice Speaker, all Senators. Thank you for opening this discussion to public comments. I am Trini Torres, a Chamorro woman from the village of Totu, Totugu, Mung Mung, Mighty. I am a member of the Colonized Chamorro Coalition and chairman of the Decolonization Commission Task Force for Independence. Must I continuously remind you that this island and the Marianas Island 
archipelago is the homeland of the Chamorro people. When our livelihood and the survival of our people is in trouble and is slipping away from our control, particularly when we are overwhelmed by people from everywhere, then we must get together and practice our cultural values of inafamolik, inagwaija, dan ina aduda. Do what is necessary and right for our people and our island. But bear in mind that there are those people who are here to profit but may not be willing or want to share the burdens of responsibilities with the people living on the island and who are trying to make a decent living, some barely meeting their basic necessities. Yes, you may need to raise some of the fees, but reasonably. You may need to reduce the tax exemptions for the big businesses and allow some room for the small businesses to survive. And you may need also to eliminate some of the qualifying certificates in order that we, the people of Guam, can live a little decent life. The original reason and intent to invite companies to come and invest in our island is so we can improve our island economy for our island people's livelihood. Not just to see these companies and to watch them live it up and control our, our island. Basta manafan sopas estinatotagwigi islata. You are the legislative senators, the lawmakers of Guam. Also, those autonomous government of Guam agencies need to turn over some specified percentage or portions of what net incomes they make after meeting their expenditures and obligations. These agencies, such as the airport, commercial, uh, commercial port, GPA, GWA, and others were and still are a part of our government of Guam service agencies established to serve the people's needs, not just to make profits for themselves. They are not private corporations or companies. They are government service agencies. Whoever gave them their autonomy should amend the laws and hold them to submitting portions of their profits to maintaining the rest of the government of Guam responsibilities. In the end, we are ultimately responsible for our lives, for our island. No one will venture to lend a helping hand to our predicament here because the because the big, rich businesses, especially the multinational companies, can always pack up, abandon our island to save themselves, and make their profits elsewhere. Please hold them also responsible, as well as ourselves, to improve our people's livelihood on our island. Fanogi Tamoru, Fanogi Senators of Legislature and Guahan. Thank you very much, Ms. Doris. With that, I'd like to uh, allow for the testimony of Mr. Paul Blas. Afade, everyone. Vice Speaker Kavo and members of the 29th Guam Legislature. On behalf of the Committee to Keep Guam Working and the 40,000 private sector workers and their families, we would like we would like to, to reiterate that we are open to certain tax increases and fees provided that, provided that the government change its ways, it does its operations substantially lasting and permanent change to the way it conducts business. We can no longer stand for the government's business as usual. We must provide an efficient government should it require the furlough or reduction in workforce. Now's the, now's the time to do it. 
this is this step must be taken now. The bottom line is the is the private sector has been subjected to the ups and downs of our economy. We adjust how we operate to remain competitive. We take the brunt of the increases. Now it's time again that the government step up and do its part to operate efficiently and efe and effectively. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Blas. Uh, Ms. Mimi Iwana. Good morning. My name is Mima Iwana. I'm the president of Ocean Jet Club, which is a tourist. I'm in this business uh, about 19 years. In the last 19 years in Guam, you, everyone knows we went through so much. Several typhoon, major typhoon, earthquake, you name it. By the way, uh, I'm Japanese, but this is my home. I've been here 21 years old. I love, this is my home. Every time when I go back to Japan, after three days, I miss Guam so much for every angle of it. And I have two children, they are Guamanian too. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so the last 18 years in this business, it wasn't easy at all. It was so hard. Being the private sector, before we talk about this bill, I wanted to stress, during this hard time, I did not get any help from government agent. Maximum time, I have 130 employees, including myself. Now downsized to 70, 74, including myself. So when the September 11 hit, Typhoon Ponsongwa, none of the agents stopped by or show us concern, how are you guys doing? You know, just that. But when they have a problem, they're going to target private sector. I, I really feel unfair, very unfair. Uh, there's a one agent, particularly revenue and tax. There's a, not really the agent. One individual was really helping me. When I have a hard time to pay a lot of taxes, they offer me a payment plan. Without their help, I know my company, myself, my family won't be here. But the other agency wasn't there. Federal came in, the government not make any offer to support document or anything. So basically we have to do what we can, meaning we have to downsize, which is 150 some employee to maybe 100, maybe even 80. Now it's 70. But during those time importances, my gaining is I learn to deal with and I have gained confidence is rather than the quality, I mean the quantity, I learned to have quality people. And my working, my employees are very, very hard worker, 73, including myself, 74. 5% of 73 is a minimum wage. Public sector, we are facing the minimum wage increasing this year. That's a huge thing. When you look at it, my, my company, 5% of minimum wage people are nothing. But important is, is the rest of 95% employee will get affected. So I have to, everyone has to raise it. And there's a huge issue. So every other week we have a lot of meeting training to bring the employee to be a qualified people. So now the Bill 74, my issue I want to stress is, I don't know the government agent a couple of months ago on the front page, 2200 could lose a job. Do you think the public sector will not give them a job if they are quality people with the skill? Of course we are dying to have a quality people can contribute some positive stuff for public sector. We have a lot of benefit, health, 401k, retirement, all this benefit, no different than government. The door is there, but it's up to the quality people, the skilled people, qualifying people. So if the issue is we don't want to hurt Guam people losing a government job, I don't think anybody are too serious to studying what the private sectors are doing, ongoing, training after training to give this employee skill. We are skilled people. Private sectors are very outgoing, hardworking, and learn to deal with a lot of different languages if it's necessary and they're aware of their position. 
We have a class uh, driving license school. A lot of the, we, we have about 20 people, Micronation Island people, they can read very well. So we do, every 10 days we held a class. They study English and to get to the point comprehending English. So they can go take a driver's license. Driving is, school, driving is not a problem, but reading is a problem. So we offer them a class so they can upgrade a skill. We tell them, get off from that lot of eight. This is not your style. You have a child. Seems like you don't have to make a child, but you don't know how to support. So don't rely on the federal aid or all this. You have to put yourself. So anyway, all the public sectors are doing ongoing training to give their opportunity, give them opportunity with a skilled job. So I, I just want to stress this increasing taxes, like uh, Mrs. say, certain taxes, I totally agree. Driver's license for $5 two years, that's ridiculously low. That's, I have a no objection. Property tax, I don't know my opinion, probably the Guam is the lowest. I don't see why we cannot increase. But other taxes, Senator, please be careful. Because if private sector lose our direction or cannot function since we cannot get any funding from government, basically we are our own. If the private sector crash, it's a very, very scary thought. It, it's a very hard and harmful for the people in Guam. Please save us. Because I love this island, I love all of these people are so wonderful and warm. There's nothing in else uh, place we can experience this. We have to save, but uh, continuously educating a people, uh, if you're not qualified, I'm sorry, you have to go. The door is there. One last thing, yesterday I went to land management to get a one single information for latest uh, bill the past generator the EPA passed the regulation. So I wanted to find out what's the more detail. I have to wait one hour and 20 minutes to just to get a one piece of paper. Nobody knows. There's a government passed that law, regulation. EPA is a government function. Land management is a government function. Nobody knows, and I guess it was a timing, three o'clock. There was a lot of people talking to among each other the customers are not served. And after an hour and 20 minutes, I wait, I get one piece of paper and told me to go three other different places. I mean, it's ridiculous. So if that's the case, please don't be afraid to, you know, lay off. Lay off may be the harsh words, but give them a better opportunity. If they are qualified, skilled people, private sector will have a confidence to give them a good job. They're not going to go die. We are all strong enough. We will help out each other. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Miss Iwana. Uh, Dr. Peter Mayer? Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I first came to Guam in 71 or 72, frankly. I was thinking about it. And I have left, but I've left for uh, China and Japan. I've not returned, well, I visited the mainland, but not to, uh, to live. Uh, I suggest that you do it, keep it simple, because you're doing this in a rush. And that you, uh, you raise the original thing of raising the G GRT, and it's simple. It's less damage, damaging than the uh, fee proposal. And it has immediate effect this year. You don't need to wait till next year. Someone pointed that out in the, uh, when uh, talking out there. Uh, the problem with the pros fees, arbitrary numbers without thought. Already there are, are nuisance fees without function, the pool table. And there, there's proposal for an uh, for a bowling alley fee, I don't see what function that has, what administrative function that has. Call it a tax, but it's a very inefficient tax. And same for the hotel room. And there are others like that. 
Also, in the land management fees, there are certain ad valorem fees that are increased that make no, no sense to increase ad valorem t uh, fees. At least there's no inflation adjust, uh, a justification. There is a $1 fee per $1,000 transaction real estate transaction fee. All right, the real estate transaction fee uh, transactions have become larger with inflation, so the uh, monetary fees have increased. You don't have to increase them from one to five. Same with something concerning, I, there was a similar thing concerning securities. Um, even if you go through them with the attitude we won't accept them unless we can justify it. You're going to go, do things that you will regret. However, the fee structure does not make, uh, oh, and in incidentally, the fees for automobiles, for not uh, heavy, uh, heavy uh, vehicles, really sh uh, the wear on the road is an exponential function that it goes like that per axle weight. So you really should have a fee uh, related to axle weight. So if you have two axles, it does less damage for the road. Um, and I'm sure there are other things like that through there that I happen to know this, uh, as others I don't. Um, and so high administrative uh, uh, fees is a very high administrative cost uh, way to raise money. Now, I do say I have a proposal for uh, have, have some uh, cost accounting go through the fees. I also favor tax reform. Now, this is very self-serving uh, because I know more about Guam. Well, let's say there are lawyers that know as much about Guam taxes as I do, but basically no one knows more than I do. No one's more qualified. So when I say tax reform, I'm being uh, very self-serving. I don't think you this is a uh, rush, rush, you're going to do things very well. Um, now, it's also through expenditure. There have been some things in the paper that frankly makes no sense, uh, the women's, but they've been small, but you really should eliminate. It's much more, sens it's, it, that's, that's really economizing much better than cutting everything 5%. Uh, there seems to be still a commission uh, concerning privatization of G GTA. Now, it's only a few hundred thousand dollars. And then there's less for this women's organization. Heck, the problem with them in America now is the way we raise our men or our boys. At any rate, there are things. Now, you can have a commission. Uh, Truman hired former uh, president um, Hoover and the Hoover Commission started to go, go went through the federal government to check for duplication and nonsense. I think you can hire a commission. I don't know anyone who is a stature of Hoover to head it, but, uh, but I'm saying that there is a long-term issue, but short-term, uh, keep it simple. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Meyer. Uh, Mr. Bill Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I feel like Abe Lincoln here. I've, I've got notes on the back of an envelope. And uh, they may make some sense to, uh, to everyone here. Uh, first, let me say how grateful I am that uh, you, you made this hearing possible because we in the private sector had the idea that budget rescue bill was going to pass and you weren't going to hear from us and so let me let me thank you for for doing this we heard yesterday it was going to be yesterday afternoon and then uh, at lunch I heard no it's been moved to tomorrow thank you Paul for telling me uh, I, I think if, if I have a role here today it is to be like a sign on the side of the road that says proceed with caution Particularly when when dealing with this with this budget bill, it's going to have such far-reaching implications. Uh, I have the the greatest respect in the world for Dr. Peter Meyer. Uh, 
man is a tax genius. And it's, it's always been a frustration for me that we don't have legislated on the books somewhere a tax policy for this territory. We have not uh, no economic policy. We don't have a tax policy. Consequently, we come up to these crisis periods and, and we expect our legislature to, to uh, fix things financially with very little guidance except for um, what I call the usual complainers, uh, and we all know who they are. But uh, you, you struggle every year with, uh, and, and most particularly this year, with an ad lib kind of ad hoc, my God, what are we going to do? We're in terrible, terrible trouble. Uh, one of the most irritating things that I've seen in, in this whole discussion over the last couple of three months is this number where 2,000 people are going to get laid off. And I think that was the worst, maybe the, the worst kind of PR for our government, where, where you've got government leaders talking about a 2,000 person layoff and nobody has done the numbers. Where did 2,000 come from? What, what about uh, 1,871 or 2,314? It was some blanket number that somebody sat around and said, this will scare the dickens out of everybody. We'll tell them about a 2,000 person layoff. Uh, I'd, I'd ask that our, our legislative leaders s step on people that, that come up with uh, with comments like that, and, and early. Don't let it get out and gain currency in the community. The, the trouble with these ad hoc kind of budget rescue things is there's going to be a lot of unsound decisions that, that people are asking our legislative leaders to make. And uh, among those unsound decisions are things like tax increases and increases in fees, and it, it all seems to be done uh, as, as I've got here, on the back of an envelope someplace, and, and no, no sound thinking at all going into this. Uh, as Mrs. Iwana pointed out, the private sector here has been battered, in case you have forgotten about things like uh, uh, PACA and SARS and 9-11 and, and subsequent typhoons and uh, Three dollars and what did I pay for it yesterday? Seventeen cents a gallon for gasoline. I don't know how the guy's making seven, eight dollars an hour. He's coping with three dollars an hour gasoline. Really don't. But um, I would, I would just go back to my original point. Please think of me as a sign on the side of the road for the members of this legislature. A sign saying, "Proceed <coughs> with caution." Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gibson. Mr. Peter Suniata? I'll, I'll use this. Does this work? Uh, thank you, Senator Calvo, members of uh, this legislature. Uh, Suniata, here uh, not wearing any hat other than uh, um, citizen of Guam. And I'm going to take advantage of this public hearing, not necessarily to address anything specific to uh, Bill 74 necessarily, so if I get too far off, please go ahead and cut me off. But then again, you can't because it's a public hearing. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and I'm not here to make friends nor enemies. Not uh, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not here to make friends nor enemies, but uh, I, I just wanted to, to bring to the attention maybe, and I've shared this with, with uh, people in the chamber. I've shared it with uh, uh, some senators here and there, and I've shared it with uh, folks out and about in the business community, both in the tourism industry and, and the general uh, business sector. And while we're paying a lot of attention to the general fund, I, I just wanted to bring your, to your attention, there's another fund not to lose sight of, because this fund, the, the Tourist Attraction Fund, if properly watched or have given the attention as well, is going to feed your general fund. And I guess what, uh, what I want to bring up is the fact that your, your Tourist Attraction Fund, the purpose of it is to market Guam, and to, and to uh, improve the facilities, create attractions, and, and improve those, uh, those attractions that we have. Those things that bring tourists to Guam. 
And right now, we have a tourist attraction fund that is funded by only one entity or one, one industry within the tourism industry, and that's the hotels. They pay the 11% uh, hotel occupancy tax. Yet there are many, in the, many direct beneficiaries of tourism that piggyback off this. There are many in the industry that do not pay. Uh, you're, you have one, one sector paying for all. And I think we need to, instead of raising taxes, you can look in that area of increasing the tax base. Uh, what I'm getting at is, and, and increasing the tax base to the point where you can actually even reduce the hotel occupancy tax, which I think is a win-win. And what I mean by that again, or what I'm proposing, or, or want, uh, would, would wish that the, uh, this legislature would think about, is that you have golf courses, you have wedding chapels, you have restaurants, you have retailers, you have brand name retailers, all of whom pay not bus companies, tour agents, all of who do not pay anything to attract the tourists to Guam in terms of the tourist attraction fund. And I think if you start to delve into that and you increase your tax base, you will have more money that will go to the GVB or private privatize the marketing, it doesn't matter. But you, you would have more money to go towards marketing, you would have more money to go to the improvement of parks, and you would have more money to, again, improve the overall tourism uh, experience on Guam. And by doing that, when you increase that, if you, if you do stronger marketing, more money for marketing, more money for better products, it goes right back to those direct beneficiaries. And those direct beneficiaries of, of the tourism dollar, whether it's golf courses, the optional tours, the agents, the retailers, brand name retailers, they will in turn be paying more GRT. They will in turn be hiring more people. They in turn will be building up the general fund. So while we're eyeballing and concentrating on the general fund, look at the, look at the tourist attraction fund and look where you can build from there. And I don't think... Uh, 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 and I really believe you, you need to look there because instead of tapping the smaller guys and maybe a, a little bit of what uh, uh, she was saying here earlier, you got to go for some of the some of the folks here who make a bunch and a bunch and a bunch of money to their credit, but aren't and maybe pay a hundred dollars for their membership of the GVB to help attract those tourists here. There are retailers here that that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars if not a day in month in a month easily but they're not contributing to draw that tourist here so i think there are a lot of other sources to tap from uh, in the tourism sector that can help bring more tourists here help fix the attractions here of which they will benefit again but from that we build the, the general fund so i'm looking at it from a revenue side uh, i'm not going to go into details of, of this bill in terms of cutting and and the smaller stuff, I mean, the smaller stuff all add up, but it really hits all of us here. It hits the general public more when there's a lot of folks that are just riding on, the, on, the, on our location, riding on the, on the wonderful uh, hospitality of our people, riding on, on, on the business that can be had here without really contributing to the draw. So I leave it at that, and I thank you for uh, hearing me out. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ada. And with that, uh, I'm looking to the members of the body for any comments or questions that they may have. Uh, Senator Judy Guthards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, and good morning to our guests this morning. Thank you for taking the time to come down and to share your views with us and some of your recommendations. I have uh, one question for Dr. Mayor, yes. and good morning, Peter. Welcome. Uh, Peter, you know, the governor earlier said, I guess it was about six or seven weeks ago, that this bill was critical to him and these fee increases are critical to him. Just a moment. Uh, and, please repeat that. Uh, he said that these fee increases are critical to him and these uh, other additional revenues are critical to him. Otherwise, he would be forced to... Uh, furlough and perhaps terminate up to, I believe I, the figure I heard was between 1,500 and 2,000 government of Guam employees. Now I'd like to ask you as an economist, if these fees were not approved, 
And if the governor, in fact, would execute his furlough plan and or termination plan, what would be the impact of uh, 15 to 2,000 GovGuam employees uh, with their bi-monthly paychecks? What would it be the impact of that on the economy at this time? That's a question that I should be able to answer better than I can. One thing, Minnie, as so much as I respect you for being a success in business, <laughs> is, is this on? Yes. Yeah, success, uh, success on business. Uh, it's going to be a long time before the private sector is likely to absorb that number. And they're also going to be very capable people who just said their profession is in government. Um, so it it, it will uh, not uh, it probably will. Let's say you lay people off; it's bad. It affects. Uh, it, it also affects the function of of government unless you do it. Because in general, government workers work hard for very little effect. Unfortunately, it's been my experience from my own work. Um, so I say, yes, it's going to co uh, cost, uh, going to be uh, hurt, the, hurt the economy. I, I'm not going to try to put some numbers. I'm not going to try, to try to believe this. I'll also say something else because basically there is a article I wrote, wrote in a, a credible, in, uh, not a super international journal, The Theory of Political Patronage. And part of the point is that in local governments, labor works, machines don't. And so it's not peculiar to Guam that we don't have the, uh, we, do, we don't have the, uh, well, let's say revenue and taxation could do more uh, with the people they have, but they need training, human capital, and capital equipment so you can file electronically. That would save uh, save them, uh, prove the service, and save them money. There are things like this, uh, which is not really an answer to your question. But if you're going to uh, reduce government, uh, you really have to improve training and the uh, the early retirement meant that, uh, that that trained people left. And I saw this in revenue taxation of very capable people, but just being over their head. Uh, Great. Well, that's helpful. Uh, so if, if I'm interpreting I'm sorry, your, I, I, I answered it very poorly. Okay. If I, if I interpret you correctly, you're saying that if we were to lay off, not we, but if the administration were to lay off or terminate between 1,500 and 2,000 GovGo employees, that... Uh, there would be a negative effect on the economy at yes. this time. Uh, do you think that private businesses would be able to absorb these employees at this time? I doubt, because businesses are in trouble, I doubt they will be able to absorb that number. Now, do some mm -hmm. probably will also uh, be able to get a job someplace other than Guam. Uh, but I, I, I can't picture in uh, oh, a year's time without a, a big peak of unemployment. Yeah, my, my, my reason for asking this, Dr. Mayor, is that uh, we know we've lost a substantial number of middle class uh, employees on our island who've left the island. They've mm -hmm. gone elsewhere and they've taken their uh, tax payments with them to other states. These are folks that used to work here, were employed here, uh, previously with the federal government or with the ship repair, repair facility, or even with some uh, businesses that closed down who had pretty good jobs. They left the island, took their tax payments with them. So we have seen sort of a deterioration in our, our middle class on Guam in terms of our tax paying <coughs> middle class on the island. Uh, would you caution us to be very careful about how we deal with the issue of government employees. Uh, no one in this legislature supports, that I know of, uh, furloughing government employees. But the governor has mentioned this as an option. If he can't seem 
to get the resources he needs that he would be forced to do this. I, what, what would you recommend? What could we do to avoid this? Well, you know, one thing, we really don't have any numbers. I mean, that's the very thing that uh, Bill, Bill raised. There are probably, we really don't know, uh, know what's uh, that well what's going on. And I certainly, there are probably people that know better than I that have studied it. But uh, I don't, let's say, having been a former government employee, uh, I think, I, I don't know how seriously I should be taken. But I think there will would be uh, problems. Now, frankly, when I wasn't able to get a job, I uh, moved off to China and then Japan. And then there was a boom here. And when my non-renewable contract was not renewed a second time in Japan, uh, someone said, do you want your old job back as a government economist? Um, but I, I did did leave you you're going to lose you're going to lose some people off island i was unusually lucky that was uh, japan uh, particularly was uh, i like anyway appreciate your input dr mary and uh, i uh, i'm very concerned about uh, this possibility and well, i'm sh i'm sure that this legislature is very concerned about it also. Also, I'm concerned who would be laid off. I mean, there was this early retirement, which was counterproductive. I, the one thing that article that I claimed that when there was a tight budget, you'd uh, have less problems. I did not have any empirical evidence for that. I think early retirement makes actually the problem of uh, not enough capital, including human capital, worse. Uh, one last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Mayor, there's been some discussion about the government perhaps selling some of its assets, uh, assets that it has, including land. It has land, you know, some very valuable land. Do you think that's a good option in times like this for the government to sell its land? Well, I personally think government is a little bit like a typical person. Let's say... I would never recommend a family selling land, leasing it, unless they're a business family, then they will invest it in something else. I would say the same thing for government uh, uh, long-term long uh, term leases. And look there. That sort of answers my question. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Guthert. Uh, Senator Adolfo Palacios? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in observation of the comment made by the owner of the Ocean Jet Club, uh, her own experience, that she had to wait five, uh, about an hour to get a, just one sheet of document. One of the major reasons why fees are being contemplated uh, for adjustment upwards is so that the additional fees would enable this government to perhaps hire more people, which would lead, of course, to increased service. And so probably that way, the waiting period would be shorter. Uh, this government does not have the authority to print its own money. This government depends on taxes it collects and fees in order for it to be able to continue to provide the service. The financial economic condition is just not favorable. The projection for the revenue that we projected last year is just not coming through, and that is why this government is forced to reconsider its position. Bill 74 contains a part where government will cut costs. We are not at that part yet. And the reason is that this body would like to know how much revenue it can collect in terms of taxes and fees so that then this body can determine how much cost it needs to cut so that the, balance, the budget can balance. And those are the few reasons really that, that this comes about is to enable this government to continue to operate and to continue to provide the service so that longer waits will be shorter and more expedited services would, would come about. 
uh, perhaps uh, the debate would be the amounts or the areas uh, or the new fees. But at this point, I guess there's a general agreement that the at least the existing fees need to be adjusted upwards because the existing fees now makes this make this government dependent on providing the services because now it's receiving it and the adjustment is just to be able to inc to increase it and that's that's my observation and that's that's my explanation but the the input that we're getting now of course uh, would would bring this into a a, a more more uh, i guess more refined perspective of what we need to do and it, it's helpful because now we, have, we can have a more balanced budget, I guess, a, a, and a more equitable distribution of whatever is the obligation that may come about in the end, and at the end of Bill 74. And that's my remark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Palacios. Senator Respicio? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, good morning to everyone. Uh, I want to say uh, this morning you have a very uh, balanced panel up there, uh, Mr. Chairman. You have both members of the uh, business community. You have the Employers Council. You have a uh, respected economist. And you have a um, member of uh, Nashon Chamorro uh, who continues to um, fight for uh, uh, the Chamorro rights here on the island. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to say that I was following the um, discussion uh, earlier on television. And I want to say that I uh, absolutely agree with the sentiments expressed by um, members of the business community uh, that in order uh, for you to uh, raise these fees, uh, you must first demonstrate that the government has done something significant uh, to cut back on its uh, operational side of the house. And, and I always think of this um, budget process, Mr. Chairman, with the same way in which we manage our own uh, household finances. It's kind of like a uh, sibling that uh, continues to uh, live uh, outside of its, um, beyond its means, and then goes back to the family and says, you know, I got into some trouble, uh, can I have, can I borrow a loan? And then yet uh, the family keeps giving this uh, individual money, but yet uh, he or she has done nothing uh, to significantly uh, uh, pare down uh, uh, that family's lifestyle in order to live within its means. And, and but I, I don't like that the debate now is, uh, has gone from the business community versus the government of Guam, uh, employers versus employees. The uh, government of Guam uh, employees, Mr. Chairman, uh, cannot be the uh, sacrificial lambs uh, in this whole equation. Uh, and if it uh, must come down to that um, drastic measure, then we have to be uh, open and transparent about uh, what we're really uh, tending to do here. Uh, the best that we have done so far is to uh, pare down the uh, operational side of the budget by about $20 million dollars but not because of any uh, sound uh, fiscal policies, but simply because of a, a mandate that required directors to uh, report uh, on a quarterly basis uh, what their staffing patterns in, the level of appropriation versus what kind of cash allotment they received. And because they simply didn't comply with that reporting requirement, uh, they got stuck with the automatic 5% uh, deappropriation. And when the administration said that uh, this would not impact personnel, uh, I didn't believe it. But if we're going to continue to be guided by these kinds of folks who express to the legislature what our financial uh, condition of the government is, and if we're not going to do any measures like have them raise their right hand and swear under oath that the information they're providing to us is true, then what else can we do, Mr. Chairman, to but then to simply believe that they're uh, acting uh, on the best uh, interests uh, of the island of Guam? And uh, we have known uh, that to be uh, otherwise. But we don't swear these people in. We don't hold them accountable for the things that they say. And we're simply going to proceed in this budget process by saying, oh, there's a opportunity to deappropriate $20 million, but yet we're not doing anything to recognize what this $20 million impact will mean uh, to the government of Guam. Uh, it's, it's like uh, me saying, oh, I'm just going to, I can't afford to stay in my house, so I'm just going to move out. I move my family out, we go and rent a cheaper uh, a place, we go into an apartment, but yet my mortgage is still there. And, that, and until, I rec until I sell that house or until I do something or rent it out or do something to satisfy that, uh, that debt, I'm going to find myself in uh, bankruptcy. 
And that's, that's, the, that's the issue, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's why I moved the amendment that said no deappropriation shall result in the termination, furlough, salary reduction whatsoever, the classified Guam employee. I never, that amendment never, does not prevent the governor this day uh, to initiate the uh, furlough process or take uh, those kinds of drastic uh, measures. It simply means that that deappropriation will not result uh, in those things, and you know that's subject to more uh, debate. But obviously, the um, PDN uh, found an opportunity to 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 take that amendment and spin it uh, out of control to where I did the most uh, irresponsible thing ever. And unfortunately, it's permeated down uh, to uh, the uh, members of the business community and also members of the uh, of the island community. But but people are watching. They know what we said early on versus what's currently happening. And they know that we've done nothing so far to recognize the true operating requirements of the government of Guam and to recognize uh, how this government has never, ever lived with, within its means. So uh, I agree. Uh, the other day, uh, the uh, senator from Barragata said, why are we doing this now uh, when we're in the committee of the whole? This whole idea of fee increases should have been done before the legislature convened to address uh, Bill 74, should have been done uh, by having a public hearing. And we support that. We believe that this process should have gone through a public hearing so we could hear from the members of the community that would be uh, impacted the most, both the uh, business owners and also the taxpayers. Remember, there's a lot of fee increases that are going to impact the uh, everyday uh, individual out there. Even the whole idea of having to pay more to mortgage or, or to uh, register uh, your deeds to your home it's going to cost uh, thousands of dollars more uh, than it uh, would uh, otherwise. But, Mr. Chairman, my, my message here is I just hope that we don't continue down this road of pitting the employers versus the employees, the private sector versus the government of Guam. We live in this uh, island community, and this problem is uh, everybody's problem. Uh, if the government doesn't function and doesn't deliver on its basic services, you have uh, uh, Ms. Mimi here waiting uh, over an hour at the Department of Land Management. Now, if government was more efficient for her, then she could have went back to uh, Ocean Jet Club and uh, make money so that they can make money uh, to pay taxes that will fund the government. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's cyclical and uh, it's symbiotic, and I think uh, both have to coexist. And we have to sit down uh, both as private sector, as government of Guam, at the same table and figure this out. And figure this out as opposed to saying, government, you must fire uh, 1,500 to 2,200 employees. I did it in my business. Uh, I went from 170 employees down to 74 or something like that. But, you know, when the private sector downsizes and lays people off, where do they go? Mr. Chairman, they go to public health and they apply for food stamp, they apply for welfare, they apply for MIP. When a government of Guam employee loses his job, it still goes back to the uh, government of Guam and, 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 and avails uh, himself or herself to those social services. So the, the, it's very easy for the private sector to stand up and say, I laid off about 50 people last year, but ultimately who's going to be responsible for those 50 people that lost their jobs if they weren't able to go get another job uh, within the private sector. It's social services, Mr. Chairman, and that impacts uh, into uh, uh, if they don't have any insurance, they go to GMH because GMH is the only uh, locally hospital here on the island, has a mandate that they can't turn anybody away. They must see these uh, uh, individuals. Their children don't have any uh, health insurance. The government bears the uh, expenses, so we're seeing a huge uh, impact to our social services programs. They don't have an income. They, they get into an argument with their spouse. Domestic issues arise. GPD comes in. That's another government service. That, that's another way that that uh, individual who lost their job will impact uh, in, uh, in the area of uh, uh, public safety. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. So it's very easy to say, I done my part. I laid people off. Now government, go lay your people off. To lay off 1,500 to 2,200 employees at this time, they will not have a disposable income to go to the movies, to go uh, to the restaurants, to go ride a jet ski uh, every other month if that's what they're doing now. So then certainly that's going to impact your uh, operation. So unless we can have some kind of um, 
uh, 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 analysis on what these things will do, uh, I don't believe, Mr. Chairman, that we can uh, proceed uh, in this fashion. It's unfortunate that we've been asking that we recall the uh, 2007 budget since last year. To, to do this uh, budget process uh, differently. You can't just with uh, one fell swoop of the pen say everybody shall get a 5% uh, cut without going to every single government uh, agency and saying, you tell me what your programs are. It better be consistent with the mandates and you justify the programs. We've too, we spend too many time uh, cutting, uh, focusing on the cuts when we should focus on the keeps. So rather than saying, how can you a 5% uh, impact your department, can you live with a 5% cut, we just say, is it worth it to fund 95% of your operations? And that's the kind of um, discipline I'm hoping will result as a, as a result of this uh, huge financial crisis that we're facing. And I'm hoping, Mr. Chairman, that it's not uh, business as usual. And, and we have an opportunity here to flip this whole budget process uh, upside his head and do things uh, differently. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Respicio. Senator Espel Don. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excuse me. Thank you, uh, members of the panel who came in to speak before us today. I have a question for Dr. Mayor, if you don't mind, sir. You, you, you made several interesting comments. Actually, everybody made some interesting comments, but a couple in particular caught my ear. And I just want to make sure I heard it correctly. At the very beginning, you stated that, and you cautioned us, much like everybody else did, about raising fees in, in a very rushed yeah. manner, you know. Uh, um, but then you made a comment about maybe the fees are not the ones, and, and again, I'm going to paraphrase you, are not the ones that should be raised, but maybe we should look at the GRT increase. Is that is that correct? Is that well, kind of what you said? short-term, immediate GRT. For the short term? Yes. Uh, you're not going to make too much of a mess there. Okay. Whereas the fees you're bound to. So, you, like uh, several years back, I remember that the legislative body increased fees temporarily uh, 50%, from 4% to 6%. Is that what you're at for, for a one year or two year period? I, uh, I forget what it was. Is that what well, you're recommending? Well, I'm saying that, but I think should go through because the, the fees, there are many fees that do belong, should be raised, but you're not going to do this standing on one foot. I mean, I went through some of the problems that, uh, of some of the fees when I went through. I saw were wrong, uh, didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But I, I think if you try to raise some, you're going to uh, regret it. Or I'm going to regret things. So, yes, I do think the fees should be raised. The GRT? Uh, G, uh, uh, some uh, fees? No, uh, no. Immediately, GRT, that's simple. I think there should be tax reform, which would include raising the liquor tax and making it a index to inflation. And I've written about this. Something similar in cigarettes. And actually, the GRT should be eliminated for uh, for expenditures uh, between business. It's been done for for uh, uh, goods, but not for services. I think in '87 it was done for. Go uh, but not for services. Uh, the, and a certain property, property tax considerations. All right, but you don't want to do that now. You're not going to do it in one week and, get, uh, and uh, be happy with it. So I do suggest that there should, now I, I point out the tax, I'm being self-serving. That's fine. And in, in the case of the tax, in the case of the fee, uh, uh, and having a cost accountant look at fees, um, I might take part of it, but that's not the sort of thing that is, is my profession. Right. Okay. And okay. No, I just I just want to make sure I caught that and try to understand uh, yeah. uh, your rationale on that. And, and I and I appreciate that. And again, going back to the tax reform that you were mentioning, you were saying that we we need to get some tax reform. Uh, you, you addressed it very, very. Uh, uh, you, you addressed it just, 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 just right now in saying that we, we should be taking a look at raising liquor tax and taxes on cigarettes and, and other items. And then you also went on to say that um, uh, we should eliminate GRT for expenditures between businesses. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Doctor. Excuse Mays. me. Excuse me, sir. Could you give this to him? You're not going to read it now, but I have. And I appreciate it. Uh, um, 
Uh, but again, if I can just get back to that point you were making about eliminating GRTs for expenditures between businesses. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not really sure I understand what you're saying, sir. Okay, they are, there used to be a GRT for wholesaling. Uh, I recommended in 74 or something like that, that that should be eliminated uh, in some way. And I don't believe, because no one in uh, government read my recommendations, they were read in business, but I don't believe that I had anything to do with it actually being eliminated in uh, 87. But the, the thing is that it allows, let's see, there is what to economists I would say, a a, uh, I would describe as a uh, industrial organization argument that an integrated firm pays less than if you have a wholesaler and a retailer or a specialty contractor and a, uh, an integrated uh, uh, contracting firm pays less to government than if you have, uh, if you, if you have subcontracting, they're less. And that doesn't correspond to efficiency. So it, it affects the competition both by some measure of concentration, how large the firms are, how many they are, and also in terms of threat of entry. So it allows for competition and it allowed for a large amount of wholesaling and developing. It will probably large uh, amount of subcontractors right now in the case of uh, in the case of uh, construction. Uh, what the numbers are I don't know. But I can say it had this effect in uh, in wholesaling uh, okay, I appreciate it. Mr. Gibson, it seems like you picked up the mic, and I would like to go ahead and hear what you might have to say to that, yes, sir. Senator, with regard to the, uh, the wholesale, uh, the, the exemption of the uh, GRT on wholesale, I can remember back when we were in the wholesale. Oh, was it on? Sorry. When, before the, the, uh, the exemption of the GRT on the wholesale, uh, wholesale transaction, there were probably no more than five or six wholesalers in Guam. I mean, pure classic wholesalers. You walk into there, you can't buy there. They, they're wholesalers. They don't re, they don't have a retail license. Within about seven months of the withdrawal of the GRT, there were about 150 wholesale companies, small ones, very small, some, some only a mom-and-pop operation. But within a year, there were 1,500 people employed by the wholesaling industry. It was a whole separate new employment category for the Labor Department reports. It was a good idea then. It's still a good idea. And uh, there are people who say, no, no, we've got to have a tax on wholesale. As, as Dr. Mayer pointed out, you get vertically integrated organizations, and, and they beat the, the GRT that way before when, when the legislature in was it 87 lifted the, the GRT I think it was on, on wholesale transactions uh, it created it's, a it's, whole new industry and put a whole lot of people to work who paid taxes by the way I will add a little bit that in the case of wholesaling there is a point that a wholesaler uh, that probably increased activity total not just the, the efficiency uh, as I put it at that time, you look what wholesalers do. They pool shipments. They, uh, they handle the, uh, will handle the uh, inventory management. And that's particularly important in an isolated community. So they serve a, a special pro uh, a function. And what I remember is when I did the study in 76, something like uh, the percentage of gross receipts that was wholesaling was, I think, Three percent or whatever. Uh, don't. Uh, how should I say? Don't publish that number. <laughs> but it's, it was very small. And whereas wholesaling gross receipts are greater in the states than in retailing. Now that has to do with jobbers uh, selling from one industry to another. All right. I, thank you, Dr. Mayor. Mr. Gibson, if I maybe go back to that line of uh, 
of, of discussion that we're, that we're going on the wholesalers. And one of the arguments that have been has, has been put forth in terms of perhaps uh, uh, putting a tax or re-implementing a, a wholesale tax or a tax on wholesalers, GRT to wholesalers, is that now we see a lot of wholesalers who are uh, providing and selling to the military, and as part of the arrangement, I, uh, they're saying that they're, they're – and again, I, I'm just talking from what I'm hearing, and this is all hearsay in the court of law. This is not relevant, but here we are. We're speaking on this issue. Um, that, that, that they're getting, I guess, either discounted or free shipping to the military. And again, I can't substantiate this uh, for the goods that they're, that they're providing to the military. So in essence, their costs for bringing their goods in as compared to perhaps some other wholesalers who don't have that practice or don't have that available s service, uh, they're bringing in their goods. They're selling, of course, some to the military, but of course they're selling also to the general public at large without any decrease in the cost of goods to the retailers, which would translate, I would hope, to a lessening in cost to our people. Right? So again, that the argument that they've been proffering is that because they no longer, or they, they, because they enjoy a decreased shipping rate, then, you know, again, they, they're making higher profits, so we should be able to at least uh, tax them to a degree on that. Is there a response on that, Mr. Gibson? You're in an area that I don't know anything about. Okay, I, yeah, I like I said, I, I'm, I'm just hearing this, and I'm just throwing it out to you. The thing that I, I understand about the, uh, the niceties of, of uh, the transportation, one of the things is the warehousing. A lot of companies discovered about 25 years ago how to warehouse on the water, and they got into this business of just-in-time arrivals. And, and when when it came that way, they didn't need a warehouse anymore, or at least not as big a one as they were renting before. But uh, in terms of uh, companies that are doing business with the military and, and getting products and, and, and merchandise on brought here on military bottoms, I don't know anything about that. Okay. But uh, you could find out, uh, because there's an exquisitely complicated process called federal procurement, and, and it would be in there somewhere. Okay. It may be possible. It may be going on now, but I don't know anything about that. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Gibson. And by, the, by the way, I think Bill knows more about it than I do, and he knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say one thing, that the person, that, the, that it's, a, it's a village store that really gets benefit from not having a tax on wholesaling. No, and that is the other side of, of the argument as well. That again, it, it, it will be the directly passed on to the consumers, and again, it just it just raises the the cost of living on this island uh, in a degree. Anyway, if I may, Contra, uh, Senator, if I may interrupt you, uh, from time to time, I stay stay in uh, in Manila, in the Philippines, and it is it is my consistent bad luck to wind up in a in a big grocery store behind a lady with a huge cart who is buying for her store. And so you've got to be very careful about which line you get into when you're at Landmark or SM or someplace like that <laughs> because you're going to be behind a lady who is buying 200 packages of ramen soup or something like that. She's not going to feed a family on that. She's going to sell it at a store. Strange taxes to stay up over there. <laughs> No, and I'm aware that that practice exists here as well. I mean, you see a lot of small restaurateurs who actually go to the retail store because they don't have the storage space to store wholesale bought stuff. They buy on a, again, a just-in-time basis on a daily basis, in essence, and uh, and, and go that way. So I, I, I'd appreciate what you're saying. If I may direct this at uh, Mima, uh, I, I was neighbors with you back in the day at Ocean Jet Ski, and I had a small restaurant of my own back then. Um, Mr. Ada, Sonny Ada, uh, talked earlier about uh, taking a look at this body, taking a look at the tourist attraction fund and getting other tourist-oriented businesses who directly benefit from uh, the tourist attraction funds going to marketing in, in Japan and, and other things. Can I just ask, what do you think about his ideas of looking at, like, I know you're a tourist-related business, and uh, I'm not really sure how the, the tourist attraction fund uh, uh, 
Well, I know it operates off the off the occupancy tax, but and and Sonny did mention that it basically it's uh, it's funded through the hotels and whatnot. His suggestion was to look at other tourist related activities to in which they could. Uh, 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 have some input, financial input into the tourist attraction fund. What do you think about that, Mima? Sorry, when Sunny mentioned, I was kind of surprised. But uh, this issue is, I think, his opinion is very, very sensitive. I cannot say I agree 100 percent. It depends on what company, because my case is optional tour. We have a hitting so-called obligated tax, which is to the tour agent. Believe it or not, we're getting 30 to 40 percent commission out of that retail price. That's been going on in Guam for the longest time. So, Sunny was saying is improvement and stuff. So after the retail is, let's say, $100, Japanese tourists pay $100 at the tour agent. They only pay me to my company is 60. So from that 60, I have to budget what is the improvement, what can I do to beautification so that future tourism attraction will be strong. Then I have to work hard to be part of the GHRA and tourist attraction. So I cannot say it should be applied to every company because some company are not getting those hidden tax, 40% or 30%, but most of them, minimum 20% are taking out from the beginning. So that will shrink our budget for promoting island or promoting tourists for any related the maintenance. So it, it depends on, I will do my part, whatever funds available, of course, because tourists is our bread and butter. I, I have an objection to that, but I cannot totally agree with the general or tourist attraction because you and the tourist attraction, this, that, it, it's a very sensitive issue because we are dealing with a lot of hard issue right now. The airline is increasing and uh, it's just we don't have a stability year round. We do have a three months, four months out of the years we call super busy. April this month, you notice if you walk, walk around two months, it's pretty sad, very dead. So April is the slowest out of 12 months. So it's a funny, the ratio is three to four months is super busy, three to four months is super dead business, then the rest of it is average. So we all work hard to have a, some kind of stability year round. You know, February, you can get a ticket, comes with the hotel, four five hundred dollars in Japan, wholesalers are selling. But in August, they have to pay 1500 So those are the jumping season, off season. It's a different, it's just impacting us big time. So the, the funding is, it's not a problem. We would like to do our part if we have to necessary, but it's a very sensitive issue because we are getting a lot of hit from everywhere. It's, it's hitting area. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank everybody up there, and uh, that's all, Mr. Chairman, that I have. Okay, thank you, Senator Espaldon. Senator Cabo? Okay, thank you very much. Before I go into the – I want to comment on, again, some of the views that have been brought up here, as well as uh, comments made from the, uh, an earlier speaker from the legislature. Uh, and then I'm going to also give a little point – just some information, because there, there's some historical information I have in regards to wholesalers. But before I do – any one of those. I want to just uh, acknowledge there's the Guevara family out there in, in the gallery, and they're, there's a, it's a, a home school. Uh, these are, there's a whole bunch of kids you see out there, and they're a family, and they, and they do their schooling through homeschool. And uh, they've been so interested in, in the proceedings, and some of the issues have been addressed in Bill Number 74 that they've, they've chose to come here this morning and to see uh, the, the legislative process in action. I just want to congratulate that family and, again, the interest of, of the member of, of the, again, the, Mrs. Guevara there and her to educate her kids on the uh, workings of the democratic process. And I just wanted to rise to a point of information to the Guevara family. There are 15 senators on Guam. That's how many are in this body. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
Thank you for that piece of information. I don't think the camera. Mr. Chair, scanning. just quickly on okay. the Guevara family. Their concern is really wanting to learn is in terms of the wholesome family fees, like sure. the bowling fees. How is that going to be in terms of keeping? And these are grassroots kind of uh, concerns where they go to to the um, entertainment areas and not necessarily the high cost areas. So I'm glad that they're here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Sir, Th and okay, again, uh, aside from that, I want to, before I go into the main topic, a little bit on wholesaling. And again, you know, I'm kind of lucky that in my old private sector job, I had an opportunity to travel all over the Pacific from not only the Micronesia region, but the South Pacific and, and a lot of the Polynesia and a little bit of the Melanesia region. And uh, if you go to many of these island communities, some of them have very strong wholesaling networks, but most of them, because a lot of their economies are less developed than Guam's, very weak uh, wholesaling networks. And also understanding at their development stage, some of these economies are, if you were to look at how their economies are running, it's almost a snapshot of Guam sometime in the 60s, maybe even in the 50s. And, and with that, uh, in fact, some of you who've been here quite a while remember the terminology jobbers or trading companies. Uh, that is something which you still see in some of the more uh, less developed economies of the Pacific Islands. It's something that in Guam in the, in, in the 40s 50, or late 40s and 50s you saw more of. And usually what these companies are, they're trading companies. And... Uh, Sometimes I think you'll see some of the old Gary Cooper movies, but the old old days of um, of um, how the interesting days of of, of of commerce in the Pacific, yeah, indent indentors. But a lot of these companies they have their bases in San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, uh, Seattle. A lot of them in the West Coast of the United States. Many of them don't really have, for all the areas that they touch in the Pacific, don't really have a significant infrastructure invested into any one of these island economies. Uh, you know, they, they, and I guess in the old days they worked through whatever the heck they used, telegraph or, but yeah. Um, in fact, yeah, one of the senators here has remember, uh, mentioned some of the names of these old companies. Their main infrastructure and their, and, and where a lot of the benefit occurred were in cities such as San Francisco, uh, Oakland, uh, Seattle, or Los Angeles. And these companies would, again, have their contacts here in the islands, and, and they'd either go to a semi, a mid-sized business, get enough orders for this product and that product and this one, some soap, some soft drinks, some food, uh, some clothing, some white goods, and if it's big enough, this entity, they would get it and they put it in a container. That container would come to Guam and, and that company would have about a month's worth of supply uh, until the next order came in. Um, then, of course, there were some larger companies in Guam and in some of the other islands that had the ability to buy their own container loads of products because of their, the size and the volume that they already had, they could buy these products uh, directly from the United States through their warehousing or, or their, their distribution or transportation network uh, that they have in, in the United States. Now, the interesting thing about wholesalers, and again, again you mentioned, Mr. Gibson, how it expanded uh, exponentially when, when there was a, a restructuring of the tax policy. All of a sudden, with the inception of all these new wholesale companies that were coming in, and some of them were just starts out with one product, but you know that one product was good enough that they could start adding on other products, and then they have a pretty substantial line of good products. But the benefit to the community was that now and like in the past where you would have a jobber or an indent or a, a trading company which would have this basically the control of the inventory coming from the states or a large retailer in Guam that would have also this control and of course then mom and pop or small restaurant would have to buy from them 
Now you have a company, and maybe it's not even a big wholesale company. You got a little hundred, uh, small warehouse there, and this wholesale company is, you know, they they're trying to get generate any sale possible. So if it's um, if it's a little store there in the in the in the village, or a small little restaurant, uh, and that owner of that establishment only wants uh, one case of ivory soap, or downy. Uh, or or what, uh, or, um, or wants uh, five cases or five uh, five cases sardines for, or Del Monte whatever you know you name it, but this wholesale company would able would be able to service uh, this small retailer or this small uh, restaurant establishment. With something they could absorb, they, these folks didn't have to bring a month load of supply. But by the way, that means also medium-sized stores. With medium-sized stores, they don't have to bring a month supply of inventory. Uh, they they can buy five of this or five of that and ten of that, just enough maybe for for the week, and and maybe if they're really having tough times, maybe enough for a couple of days. So, what this wholesaler network uh, again with this retooling. And I don't know if it was even intended, Dr. Mayor. It, it, I don't know how this whole, these laws came about. It was way before my time. But when they did this exemption on the wholesale tax for the GRT, it did allow for the, the uh, creation of many wholesaling companies. And one of the, the effects in it, it had allowed for some of these smaller business entities an opportunity to at least start and not have to put so much of their cash resources into inventory and it also took a little and took a and, and by the way it also that when i get back when i talk about history some of those trading companies that um again were not were, were profiting and there's nothing wrong with it they were profiting out of business in guam micronesian islands polynesian islands melanesian islands they became almost irrelevant and many of those Trading companies are a thing of the past, and and you know that's that's just how things have gone. But uh, again, I wanted to bring that little piece of information uh, to us that, in my humble opinion, a, whole, a strong wholesaler network in Guam is good not only for the economy, but most important, I think, it's good for for the small business entities that are just trying to start up. And I, again, I wanted to. Piece, uh, Again, bring my two cents into that. Uh, I was going to speak a little bit. Now I'm going to go into my the subject matter. Some of the comments and, that were made by you folks today, as well as some of the folks yesterday, uh, it's obvious there's been there has been a lot inflicted in our economy, and and you and the folks, the private sector, as well as some folks, just just a homeowner, or just like the Guevara family out there. There's been a there's been a lot uh, of burdens placed on their shoulders because of this bad economy over the past ten years, and I, I obviously I see your concerns with any increase any further increase in the cost of government services, whether it's a tax or a fee proposal. At the same time, this interesting comments made by Dr. Mayor in regards to what would occur if two thousand individuals were laid off terminated from the government of Guam and what the impact would be to to the island economy obviously there you know there would be some issues dealing with appropriations to public health on MIP and Medicaid I know some of the senators have been here around here longer than me we've seen almost a doubling of MIP Medicaid uh, and uh, MIP and Medicaid appropriations as well as welfare appropriations as a result of of the issues affecting our economy over these past 10 years. But there would be an impact in government uh, requirements for services if, if, a, if, a tenth of, if 2,000 people were to be laid off. So we have an issue here. If, if these fee proposals all go are ratified as they are, and let's say no changes did occur, and also, and again, the senator that, that was talking a little bit earlier, that who I wish to address some of his issues, if the automatic 5% deappropriation government 
services do, do, does occur, we are still going to be in an imbalance. Not a very big imbalance, but it's going to be in an imbalance of a little bit under $5 million. Now, some of the issues, by, by the way, I'm the last guy. I don't, I don't want to see layoffs. If there's ways that we can do things where government services can be provided and those services can be provided at a, at, at a, at a adequate manner and no worse than the service they're providing now and hopefully better, if there's no undue burden placed on, on the people of this island, that would put them in an even more deteriorated situation in regards to their ability to live in this island. If there was a way to find that, I'd like to find that that answer. But, and I'm going to address the issue on the on the amendment that was placed that deals with no termination, no furloughs, no salary reduction. If we are, and, and again, I'm. The BBMR director said there's absolutely no effect in in um, in uh, having to cut salaries or furloughs. He said he made that statement as of a five percent cut. I don't know how he, how he can say it, but he said it, and I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put him to an oath. But if obviously there's agencies that are at 90, 95, 98 percent of their cost is personnel cost, then obviously with a cut, then there's gonna have to be some movement somewhere. You can't get rid of all the services and just have people stay there working. The reason for the, these agencies is there's a service to be provided to the people of Guam. And it, by the way, it's not a senator, it's not the governor, don't blame it on the law that allowed for the deappropriation. There are individuals that have the responsibility of accounting for their departments, some of them being paid 70, 80, and more thousand dollars a year. Some of them pay double the, the pay of us senators here. And if they can't account for how much is coming in and how much is going out, or who or what they have employed in their in their agency, then it is their responsibility for the deappropriation that occurred in their department. And I was fully in favor of the amendment placed in by another senator earlier that there will also be, and in the future, if there is noncompliance, there will be a cut in their pay. I think it's right. But my concern about the amendment and my concern about the amendment is this. If you allow, if it is it as it is right now, it is my opinion it is inorganic because you cannot compel a governor based on a reduction in a budget to hire or not to hire or not to fire. And the catch-22 in this particular amendment, if you were to take out the termination and then it'd be organic and say, okay, you cannot furlough, it cannot be salary reduction, then you know what that means? You leave the governor only other one option is termination. And I don't know, and I, I, I heard Dr. Meyer say that. If termination is the only option, uh, it will have a significant impact. So again, I wanna thank you so much for your, your testimony here today. There is obviously some, in the days ahead, there's gonna be some difficult decisions that have to be made. Again, this, this has been presented to us, a budget bill has been presented to us halfway through the fiscal year. The original bill was imbalanced, and some of the options uh, that were sent to us, this body was not prepared to, and I'm, I'm, I'll be the first one to say, I don't like to see an increase in GRT. And also in the borrowing initiative, uh, this body deleted that borrowing initiative as well. But we've had to deal with, with, uh, with the bill that was sent to us, but we've also, we have to put out a balanced budget. 
And uh, for me, hearing from you folks today and the folks yesterday, whatever decision I make or the members of my body, at least we had the opportunity to hear it from you folks who are di uh, are directly impacted and affected by by the decisions made. And I want to thank you so much uh, again for participating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cowell. Uh, before we go on, Senator Shimizu, and then from there, we'll go ahead and uh, break for lunch. But go ahead, Senator Shimizu, you reckon? Thank you. I just have a very quick question. Um, I've been hearing um, testimonies for the last six weeks, going on seven. I, I wish we had pre-op, pre had uh, all the public hearings way before going into the operation. Now we have to stop the operation to go back and do some pre-op. I just want to uh, say that, that I wholeheartedly agree um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, do, blowing the chorus. Now, junta, we are having a meeting. Come down. Let's hear the people of Guam before we go into this. I know the governor sent over voluminous packages of, uh, of uh, uh, fees. And I really believe that we have the mechanism then, before we go into here, it's called the administrative adjudication. Like you, Peter, I've been in this government. In fact, I was born in Guam for 35 years in terms of government service. And I remembered working with you way back during the Badozo administration when I was chief of staff. So your input is, is uh, very well uh, taken. And, and with that, I, I wanted to ask w one question. I heard earlier uh, uh, the retiring speaker talking about the, the um, wholesale. And I also heard back in the days, there were only X numbers of uh, wholesalers. Today, as a result of the exemption, we have had uh, an, an increase. Uh, and, and, and by increase in, in not only the number of wholesalers, but in, in terms of the numbers of employment opportunities that we have there. And the governor, I know there's a package here somewhere that he sent down, Governor Camacho sent down for us to uh, consider. And it's just a matter of which senator uh, is going to introduce it uh, or if they're going to introduce it at home. And just um, as I understand, that packet could probably bring in $30 million to the coffers. Right now, I know the good chair uh, and Senator Respichu are, are putting forth different types of numbers in terms of what is the potential uh, shortfall. Five million here, 20 million, 30 million. But there's a 30 million packet there that was brought in. And I really hope that when we look at that exemption, they don't just push that to this body in a very short period of time without having the public hearing to be able to to uh, uh, blow the coolers again. What I basically said is to call out to the people of Guam and say, here is a proposal by the, the governor of Guam, Governor Felix Camacho, to call the people and let's have an opportunity for the people to hear that under the Administrative Adjudication Act. But be it as it may, I have one question. Uh, in, the, in the hotel, uh, wholesale industries with the exception or all the exemption given, it's usually to get industries to start developing. Am I not correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we, government has given exemptions or tax breaks well, to help Mayor, a certain industry develop. There are certain, quali you, certain qualifying certificates, and uh, frankly, I, was, uh, I think it was spring of 32, uh, uh, 72, no, uh, uh, in, in 1972, I was at the University of Guam, but I argued against giving qualifying certificates to further hotels because it, it was designed for the new business. Now, I happened to know at that time, I didn't know it would happen here, but they had a similar system in Mexico and they renewed quali they, what would be equivalent of renewing qualifying certificates which is really not the point of these qualifying certificates. Now, I also tend to have a reaction. If I knew what, uh, if, if I knew what business were to be successful, I wouldn't be a government bureaucrat, but be re wealthy. 
So that's your answer to my question in terms of yes, the, the policy was to try to help developing industries to, to develop. And at the point that I was going to get at, at what point do we believe that certain industries have matured, have matured and have established and are strong enough, maybe strong enough economically to carry some of the, uh, the uh, that everybody else have to carry in terms of their fair share of the burden. And, and, and that's basically all I asked. Uh, the next question that I'm going to ask is in this area is early on uh, 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 in the past six weeks, uh, th there was an amendment passed that amended uh, the Dave Santos, and I've spoken to the mover of the amendment and asked uh, uh, him to, to, to reconsider and, and support uh, what I'm going to do. Uh, we, we amended the Dave Santos uh, amendment to move the uh, threshold of half a million dollars and reduced it down to $50,000 for small business at the threshold, and then the exemption is on the first uh, 40000 uh, By Guam standards, uh, I, I am looking at, uh, and I've talked to a number of people uh, doing my power tests and checking out calling those that I believe are key informants that may be able to help me uh, 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 have an informed decision. And one of the questions that I ask, do you believe that uh, that uh, with 150,000, the threshold, raising it back, going back and reconsidering, raising the 150,000 for small business up to 150, from 50 to 150,000 threshold, and bring back the the, the 50,000 uh, uh, exemption for small businesses. Uh, would you consider uh, the 150,000 dollar threshold uh, at a level of small business? No, for Guam a, standards? There's a problem. I'm, uh, I'm president of a company called uh, PL Manilo Energy Consortium. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for that pretentious name. And we're very nice. We make 200,000. Uh, so, so I have a self interest in this. And um, I also, in his office, uh, Senator Calvo asked me about the whole thing of a Santos uh, Amendment, and I couldn't give a straight answer. And one of the reasons is I would want to look at the evidence. Is it true that you get several licenses, what it really is? But my general thing is I don't like notches. And really, what was that? You don't a, like a what? Notch, notches, and that's a sudden oh, I thought it was change, the nacho chips. Su I'm, I'm sudden sorry. Changes, sudden changes in taxes. Now, if you, uh, uh, you know, sudden change from uh, when you're 50,000, uh, that, that really distorts decision making. That suddenly you pay $200,000 that you didn't before if you made 50,000 and one dollar. Now, when it's a whole large amount of money, it uh, doesn't have that big a function, but still, that you uh, suddenly pay uh, uh, $200,000 more tax when you earn one more dollar, uh, that really distorts decision making in the private set. Well, decision making, period. Okay, Sidus Masi, Pedro, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I, although I mentioned this earlier, and it is, you know, in, in consideration for, I think there's a couple more individuals that would like to also speak to the, to, to the body on this thing. And uh, so that we can, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the people that are up here in our panel that, you know, would like to, to go on with their busy schedule. Why don't we go ahead and take a one-minute recess so that we can, you know, uh, excuse the, the people. And thank you very much for, for, for coming here today. Thank you, sir, doctor. And uh, take a one-minute recess, and we'll get uh, the, the two others that want, want, want to talk. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank um, two individuals that are now sitting here at the panel. Mr. Ivan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ivan Be the first time. and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Marty McDowell. And so uh, we'll give them an opportunity first to, uh, to, to speak. And Okay, we'll give them an opportunity first to speak. And Okay, thank you very much. So and who would like to go Then first? you go lunch. McDonald, I go first. No, Mr. Right. Carmelito. So, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, S uh, Senator uh, Frank Blodge, Jr. and the legislature. 
and also the uh, finance, uh, Mr. Center Vice Speaker Calvo. You know, I was here yesterday. I heard a lot, lot of rumors, a lot of comments, and most of you people are right. But you know, when we talk about politics on this bill that we're talking about, a lot of people disagree and a lot of them agree with it. Politics, to mention tax, is the most dangerous part on the politician. I remember one time, uh, former Senator Tony Stamford, when he raised the 6% on GRT, she knows he's gonna lose. I talked to her, but you know, she did it because she wants to save the government. He wants to serve the people. So I talked to her for many times, and I've seen you some of these senators here. The population, who are we blaming on these things? It's not the senator, it's not the governor, it's the people. Because nowadays it's a new generation, the population that some of you senators forget. They want service, and the population are expanding. And the more population, the more expenses to spend. So what are we talking about when we heard the hearing yesterday? That, you know, when we go around to Manmata and activities, this senator and the governor, who wants to raise tax? But if you want quality leaders, quality service, the government is run by tax. So if we, if we start complaining and all these things that I heard on Manmate and Fiesta and Cedro down the line, service costs money. The new generation, the population, the modern technology, you get a change. We got so much increase of service, like for example, gas, power, and all these things. I told one of my colleagues in Manmate, in tomorrow we say, and Malago, Majudas, and Pimajudo. If you want service, Nisito na Pasi. And Timalago service, Sempi Munga Masa Tax, or Munga Lokimangum Plain. This senator here is in the position that is very difficult for them. That's what I said in the Pandango and the Manmate. But they can't do anything about it. They have to. You expect this senator to give you all the service and the governor of the government of Guam, it takes tax to run the government. I don't care what anybody said. I ag disagree with the commerce. I agree with some of them, the commerce. My name is Ivan Borakablido. I'm fair and balanced. And I have seen all these things. And I'm in a talk show and I listen to the problems. We brought these people in to serve, to give attention, and to respect and the livelihood of the family. That's why we bought the senators and the governor. They're not there to hurt us. But I always say this, like the other night, what causes it? Nobody wants nobody want to step up to the plate. People of Guam, the population is getting big, and you expect service, and the government don't have it. The commerce are here. To support, they're not disagreeing on most of these things, but they want accountability. They want accountability of the tax. I don't bet you one of these senators, you don't know how much the general funds got. Who knows how much the general fund got at this point in time? Why? Because we're lacking of communication. Like Senator uh, Vice Speaker Eddie Carvo, I was talking to him. All it takes is communication. If you don't like me, don't like me. But let's not hurt the people of Guam. Let's give the people of Guam courtesy, respect. Let's not put the difference between a Democrat and Republicans. Let's put the people come first. Let's give the people the service that they deserve. But the one thing about it, we're not communicating. That's the difference yesterday and all the place I've been. I have the right, the guy left for me. Frank Blood Jr. I grew up with a family. But we communicate, we laugh, and we joke with Frank. And I understand where you people coming from. But you don't understand the people that's asking. They're crying, they want communication, and they want answers. What do we do? We go back and forth on budget figures. Vice Speaker here, I speak to him three times. We cannot have the answer 
if we cannot step up to the plate and give the right information. The finance guy can't do anything about it. They change from one period to another period. The next two weeks, they change it. How in the heck are you going to balance it? The commerce don't care if you raise up the tax, but they want accountability. They want to know where the tax is going. So give that information out. Let the Manamco understand. Let the young generation understand. Let's look up to you people that we bought for you, and I know all of you are good. I am not knocking on anybody out, even the commerce. I talked to Mr. McDonald, some of these race are good people. Accountability, just like a family. This is the island of the 60,000 before 70,000. This is 160,000. You cannot have the budget of that budget to expect the 60, 70,000 population to come out under 60 and have the same budget. You can. With the modern technology now, you can. All the agencies are suffering because of the population. People of Guam, please, let's communicate. Let's talk to our governor. Vice Speaker, you have been talking to the Vice Speaker so many times. Let's come to understanding. Don't like me, doesn't matter. Don't like the governor, I don't care. But don't hurt the people Guam and give the people Guam attention, courtesy, and make the livelihood. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, friend Blau Jr. and Speaker Cabo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carbolito. Mr. McDowell. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I, <laughs> Ivan, you got my vote, buddy. <laughs> Man, you, you are passionate. I love you, brother. Uh, Senators 29 Guam Legislature, good day, Senators. My name is Monty McDowell, real estate principal broker for Advanced Management, and here representing the Guam Association of Realtors. The Guam Association of Realtors wishes to express great concern with the proposed increases in GovGuam fees that will negatively impact the real estate industry. We believe the proposed increases, some of which are in excess of 1,000%, are excessive. Fees of any sort should be evaluated and adjusted at gradual increments so the net effect will be less dramatic. The Guam Association Realtors sees no reasonableness to the drastic increases proposed. The real estate industry on Guam is finally experiencing upward momentum, the likes of which have not been realized in years. The proposed increases, if implemented, will most certainly make it more difficult for our island residents to achieve their dream of home ownership and may prevent investors from buying into our island economy. As stated on several occasions by prospective off-island investors, doing business in an area that has a government quick to adjust economic factors in a manner negatively impacting the economic equation, such as the elected officials of the government Guam are currently attempting to do, is an area they, are, they as investors wish to steer clear from. With Guam's impending Department of Defense economic boom on the horizon, do we as a community really want to be perceived as a business unfriendly area because the actions of our elected officials, the Association of Realtors, think not? We understand that many of these fees have not been updated in years. However, a more moderate approach to raising fees gradually would seem reasonable. Asking the island community to bear the cost when buying or selling their home is simply too much to ask. A balanced approach to raising the fees combined with careful timing trimming of the government of Guam budget will accomplish the goals of increasing revenues and reducing expenses for government of Guam. The Guam Association of Realtors consists of companies either in the real estate business or associated with real estate business. Since the downturn of our economy in 1995, the industry has been very much in an economically depressed state. Our member companies have had to make drastic changes both economically and financially to remain in business. For instance, employee salary and benefit cuts, reduction of staff, relocation of offices to smaller, less costly facilities, and the list goes on. We could simply not vote in larger fees. The market forces dictated the economic environment. Having said that, it is believed that the government of Guam has not truly made the drastic changes economically to remain in business. We have yet to see GovGuam employees salaries and benefits be cut nor have we seen a reduction of employee numbers. 
the Guam Association of Realtors asks that you look internal and take care of your house before damaging ours. The priority of government should be grow the economy of Guam. Through economic growth, many of our island's financial difficulties will be curtailed. But how can we grow the economy when Guam has no so few skilled and talented people available for private sector employment? Perhaps if Gov Guam were to shed itself of some of its personnel talent pool, then the private sector could rapidly hire these individuals and grow the economy. More business would occur, which would result in more revenues into the Gov Guam's coffers. The necessity to look to government to do what is right is so evident, but so hard for elected government officials to accomplish, much less accept. The Guam Association of Realtors pleads that you show true leadership, do so immediately, and cease this nonsense of excessive fee increases. Sincerely, the Guam Association of Realtors. Thank you. And Senator Ben, I know it's Boca Talawani time, so. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. McDowell. And uh, before, any questions from Senator Shimizu? Okay. Yeah. And um, Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, First Mr. of all, Ivan, it's, it's nice to hear your voice. I wish you uh, uh, are able to go back, and I wish KOM will reconsider the voice of uh, fair and balance because I honestly believe, I honestly believe it, Toto. You are the Noru na Toto. Wapiti the dad ni po ma airi i i i i pinitinia. Ano siyong sasangan na? So so fan hujung sa istigi pa ako na man hunte gini papa. You know lo timan lo man malagwa man wentus lo waman inutit waman aasun. How do we know? What I said basically, I really hope that you will be able to get back on KOM and the fair of balance because I think we also get the voice of the people. We may not like it all, but you hear some of the grassroots voice of the people. Some of them may not be able to come down here because they're in Utah. They may be crippled or main or bedridden, but they can surely be able to get to the telephone and express their feelings so that they can also be up there. So those chairs that are empty there and I, the because uh, we are all part of, 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 uh, of this beautiful island. <clears throat> Guam has made, uh, some people have come uh, and made Guam their home. We didn't make Guam our home. We are Guam. <laughs> you know, generation to generations we've been here. So we should be able to also uh, have access for the, so for the people that may not have had the, the opportunity to come down here. And, and I wanted to say that, Ivan, what you have expressed, I hope that, uh, that we will be able to, to, to bring back the voices again uh, from that, because I felt that that was good, so I want to commend you for that. The, the other thing that I wanted to, to ask, and I did talk to uh, uh, <coughs> Monty and also with uh, um, Carl, Peterson. Carl Peterson, and I also spoke to, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Sonny Ada, who had uh, eloquently expressed the, the, uh, some of his views in terms of business in other public hearing in terms of how business uh, view government and, 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 and business. You know, uh, my, my sense is that <coughs> the University of Guam I chaired, I take great pride in, in producing professional people to be able to serve the, the community. We run about 800 graduates, and they're out there looking for jobs within the private sector to, be accom to accommodate them. So if you're not able to find those professional people, come to me and I will show you at every graduation that we produce. We, we invest in the minds of our people. We, and why do we invest in the minds of our people? Because it's a terrible thing to waste if we don't invest. Because it's true that that drives the engine to provide the kinds of people that the private sector needs as well as the public sector. So we graduate those, and then when they can, when they go out, because I hear them also, the graduates, that they go out. This, it, the economy is so flat that they can't get it, so they of course have to to, to go out and find their their, their careers. So uh, having said that. The other areas that I, I, I wanted to look at, and I talked to uh, the, the, a number of people, uh, and, and what I'm going to ask a reconsideration to go back to the, the Dave Santos Amendment to be able to try to bring up the small business, uh, the threshold from 50 to 150,000, and bring back the, the, the exemption up to, to 50. And I, I asked uh, m members of the community, um, mm -hmm. You know, members of the Get Guam working, you know? Uh, what did they think of this? And maybe you can answer, Monty, what did you think of the amendment that I spoke of? I can uh, tell you what I think. Uh, without consultation with the other organization, I couldn't speak on their behalf. But first of all, 
If Ivan goes back on the radio, do not go Monday at noon, okay? <laughs> I don't need the competition. Uh, and I'm also a University of Guam alumni, so I'm with you. That's University right. Of Guam. That's right. So we produced you as a, as a qualified, it. capable person to come out. I'd but like to see, to see the, uh, as far as the David Santos Act, I, I like what you, what you uh, propose. I'd like to see a little more. We had 500,000. The first 50,000 uh, was exempt. Uh, if we're going to change it downward, the threshold, I'd like, let's just, let's make a compromise and go halfway. Let's go to 250,000. If an employer uh, has three or four employees, they're probably right around that. And the 50,000 tax exemption allows them the additional revenues, like an incubation, like a small business development <coughs> center does with some businesses, an incubation period to me, they will graduate from at some day from that $250,000 level and they would pay in gross receipts tax on 100% of their their uh, gross gross sales. So, but the threshold, if it's going to go from 500000 down, 50000 is way too low. 150000 is is more like it. 250000 is is where I would like to see it go if it's, if it's going to be changed at all. Thank you, Monty. I, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad <coughs> to know that you're an alumni of the University of Guam, my alma mater. And we really produce a, a lot of good people coming out of there because, you know, Guam is really in the crossroads of international market. You know, we, we have so much advantage. The first hundred years of America may be the Atlantic coast, but I re honestly believe that the next hundred years is going to be the Pacific coast. And I, and I thank you for your candid uh, 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 reaction to uh, the proposal uh, that I'm making. I need to also try to convince uh, some of my colleagues to, to reconsider. I know the good uh, chair, uh, I had spoken to him and uh, uh, it seemed that this is reasonable and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's basically all that I have to say. Uh, you gave me this copy, the amended, on this uh, thing to 50,000, 250,000. Uh, I respect uh, Mr. McDonald and I, I go along with to compromise. But let's look back. You know, how many employees the mom and pop got? Let's look back that the kids are there. It's a family store that they, they don't have too much overhead because they can't afford it. So they got mom and dad and, and the uncles and auntie helping each other. But to compromise is a good comprom uh, compromise to this one. The intent is good, but you have to go back and rephrase that into a certain, you know, mom and pop store is just a, a 200 by 200, whatever it is. It's not as big as, as Payless or a, a California Mark or, or, you know, and they got big warehouse. Mom and pop goes and buy it to the distributor. So I think, Mr. Madal, we compromise on that. We go with 250000 So we're in agreement. <laughs> like, okay. Wow. Any other questions from any? No other questions. Well, first off, I'd like to thank Mr. Carbolito and Mr. McDowell for taking the thank opportunity you, Mr. and the time for being here. Thank you for the, the, the insightful thank you very much. information that you've been able to provide. With that, uh, what we'd like to do is uh, we'll go ahead and call for a uh, lunch recess <laughs> and um, we'll come back in at 2.30. All right? So thank you very much. Thank you. Recess, lunch recess until 2.30. Thank you very much.